and um, so we all did enjoy our last social evening last night. So many people told us how much they enjoyed it, and uh, it made me think uh, in that enjoyment that if I had not had Leo, no one would have had those pleasant, wonderful evenings. For if Leo's coming into the picture made it all possible for struggling alone with a message up in New York and knowing very well, now at least not realizing, that I was talking over the heads of people, I had never been able to gauge what I thought was the, the a, a level of intelligence of human beings. I had lost thought it was very much higher than it was, and I could not account for, for uh, their not understanding what I thought was so utterly simple. I remember in my first lecture after 1946 started, uh, the day of myth, in which after 25 years I should begin my work, and Leo, as you know, came two months before that, the very first one of those lectures was given in Boston, and it started on the level about ten squatters above where I should talk, and they were sat on the front seat there, and I could see by her very looks that she was trying to pull me down. I thought a concern, pull me down to more of the human level not up in the car so far, and she did pull me down a little, and a little more, and other lectures until gradually, after two coast-to-coast -coast lectures, and with, her, with uh, hundreds of conversations between us, in which her illumination and mine mingled, She introduced more of the human element, the human approach to my, well, I won't say inhuman approach, <laughs> but my just as well, my just as well, where I was talking to the crowds, and as you'd know, my first book, The Universal One, um, uh, one editor said, well, there are 12 people in this world who could understand it, and, and I'm not one of the 12. <laughs> and then he resigned from his editorship of the New York World, and took that book and went into study for seven years to try to understand it. And he produced a book himself. But as he, is, he has now passed away, but he wrote a brilliant book, and all of during his life and interviewing with me, he said, if I could only cleave a climb to your star, well, I know what you're talking about, or if you come climb down to my star, where, uh, where you know what I'm thinking about. And so that really was my first trouble in all of those years. Um, I won't, how can I say it? I, I, perhaps I talk scientifically without any of the human element of, of uh, I talk scientifically of love without putting the human element of love in it. I talked a way of life with only law in it and not of the human demonstration of it. But after two coast-to-coast -coast lectures with Leo, I found a level, and then we found uh, this place in accordance with her vision. Otherwise, I'd have still been in New York. It was her vision and her own uh, destiny in life that uh, coupled with mine and made it possible to find this this place. And without that, you would, would none of us have had that wonderful social evening that we had. 
Now we wouldn't have all these wonderful friendships that have grown up in, in the years, and I doubt if even my books, any of them, would have come out for The Secret of Light had not come out, although it was written. It seems as though it could not even be printed until they came along, and then it was printed, and then other books were printed. By that time, we began to talk and think so much alike, and we found a common level, and I could not, the course that was necessary to get, I could not get it out upon that level in which I omitted the so much the human element and thought only of God, what God had taught me. And so the course would not have been possible even without there was my thinking together. So it was wonderful to all enjoy this together with Len and me and the nice evening we had and did my heart a lot of good to hear Dr. Pollock expressed that appreciation of Leo's work as well as mine. It always makes me feel good to, to, when one realizes that I work together as one and there's no differentiation mm -hmm. anywhere in it. And I think when Leo's had the chance to get her own books out as well as mine, being not so tied up in the routine that has made this place possible for I have not been able to share in that routine. I'm not built that way. I have not the managerial ability. I have the ability to even accumulate money in vast amounts. I've done it many times in all my life, but I've never had the ability to keep it or to know how to spend it. To me, money has been no more important than air. Use the air to breathe, we're well, all right. Use the money in the same way, get what you want. If you want a $50,000 group of Arabian stallions, get them, that's all right. If it fulfills the purpose, just buy them. Employ whom you need to take care of them, buy oats by the car load. Makes no difference. I thought that way, and I always fulfilled what I want to do. I have never had in my lexicon the idea that most people seem to have of, well, I must live within my means. I only get so much money, and I can only do so much. I have always felt that whatever desire I had should be fulfilled. And, and instead of keeping to my income, I'll say, all right, I will increase my own income so that I can do these things, and I almost did. But it was not good for me to have money. God did not want me to have money because especially after after a full realization of my destiny had come taking place. So every time I got several hundred thousand dollars or even once over half a million dollars, just take it away like that. I lost <laughs> nearly a half million dollars in seven days in the nineteen seven panic. And so I had him to thank for, for, for that, because I saw that I realized the lesson of it. If nothing better in my life ever happened to me than losing all of that money so quickly. If I lost it slowly, I probably wouldn't have had the lesson. Radioactive stepping down. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> From a high potential to low, thought of home to be very, very possibly, and and changed my thinking quite a little, and kept me more to the purpose for which I came here on earth. And I do not think that that the accumulation of money 
Although the accumulation of money was not my objective, not the slight objective, but it seemed as though I just couldn't help accumulating money. Everything I did turned to money. I had an uncanny instinct for real estate development. I bought a piece of property instinctively feeling that it was a good strategic qualification. The very fact that it's published in the papers that I purchased it, and there were a hundred other people who have been intending to purchase that piece, of course there always are, and they all got excited and came out with each other. In one case, I made $60,000 by just in a few weeks by a first piece of property I purchased in a strategic location, and so many other people had intended to purchase it, they outbid each other until I got a very big profit. Well, and I made about $200,000 a year in building buildings. But, as you see, that was an experience that I should have. It was a demonstration of, of uh, uh, versatility. And it was a thing I should do demonstrate. Should demonstrate the versatility. But the making money part of it wasn't a part of God's plan. So we took it away, and as I say, there's only one thing in life that I'm more thankful than for than that, and that was being taken out of school before I was ruined. <laughs> now, we have these questions. We've always had a question and answer period in every one of the lectures that have gone on before, but they omitted this time because I felt that my schedule was of only 20 days was too short to, to adequately present such a subject as the naturalness of the life-death principle in nature. And we could only have done it by exceeding the time limit of our lectures. It could not have been done otherwise. So we will take up these questions that are here this morning, and I'm glad we have been able to save, save one morning for them. One just given last night. Would not our most effective way of checking the trend <coughs> to the use of atomic fission be to develop better ways of producing abundant power for industry and consumer use? Yes, that would be the most effective way and that, that should be the way of doing it. To the moment, the moment that someone showed us a better way to multiply gravity, that the sun is projecting upon the surface of this earth to multiply it, multiply that projection then, so that an electric current could be produced, then the more people will bend their energies toward showing how to multiply. Now, the light of the sun is projected radially from the sun and that pro radial projection is a division of gravity. This is what I mean. 